Hi, I'm Michael. Welcome to welcome to stage one. We've got a whole bunch of development talks. In fact, the upcoming talk by Chloe Mistagi is a topic that many of us could probably relate to. Burnout, destabilization, destabilizing retention goals, and threatening organizational security. Before we start, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of our sponsors. We have INE and eLearn Security, Axonius, MongoDB, Juniper Networks, CoreLight, Google, WeHack Purple, Bridge Crew. Thank you to all of them for making this event possible. Also, don't forget to check out all the other things we have going on. There are awesome villages like the IoT Village and the Mental Health Village. We have the Expo booth that has not only our wonderful sponsors, but also there's people who are looking to do hiring, community organizations that you can join. They're not for profits that we support that many of you may not know about and may be interested in. Different booths have swag, contests, and raffles. So be sure to stop in and check out all these wonderful things. And now we have our speaker, someone who I have admired for a long time and am honored to have the opportunity to introduce. Chloe Vistagi is an award-winning change maker who is innovating tech and information security sectors to the meet today and future demands by accelerating startups and providing solutions that empower organizations and people to stand out from the crowd. She is an international keynote speaker at major information security and tech conferences and events, and she serves as a trusted source to reporters and editors such as Forbes and Business Insider. Additionally, she is one of Business Insider's 50 power players. Outside of her work, she is a co-founder of Hacking is Not a Crime, and we open tech. So without further ado, here is Chloe Mistagi. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much, Michael, for the wonderful like intro. I am very touched. Um, thank you so much for that. I'm going to play these slides now. For everyone, welcome to this burnout session. And I want to just put one thing in here. Now, in the slides, I'm going to talk a lot about how employers can be better and how we as an industry can be better. But there is one part that I left out in it, and I just want to speak on that really quickly. A lot of times when we think of burnout, we think of when it comes to our companies and what, you know, the, the workload and not balancing our personal life. But I also want to mention one thing, which is a lot about our industry and particularly on social media. Burnout doesn't just occur on in our work, in our daily life. It also happens when we're on Twitter. We are nonstop seeing a lot of of really concerning things happening on Twitter within InfoSec. And it's really important that we keep an eye out. There's so much cyberbullying that's happening and that also leads to burnout, but also it can lead to people leaving our industry. So we need to do better on that front. And I want to just bring that up really fast because I know that it's not in the slides talking about like social media, but I have seen people get burned out from it because they're seeing the drama unfolding and just can't believe what they're seeing. So let's try to be better with each other because that's how we are as a community. And I think this is a time where we need to come together a lot more than ever before. So let's dive into the slide deck now. So welcome to Burnout Destabilization, Retention Goals and Threatening Organizational Security. And overall, just think of it this way, burnout can be a security threat. So let's dive into that, shall we? But first, uh, for those that do not know me, Michael did a fabulous job <laughs> sharing a little bit about myself. But I am the co-founder of We Open Tech and Hacking is Not a Crime. And yes, that is my handle at the top. I'm also a co-owner owner of Open Tech Pledge, which is basically a project that myself and Camille have been working hard to get organizations to sign a pledge guaranteeing that they're going to do whatever they can to increase the voices of marginalized representation in leadership position because leadership is the one in charge of vision. And in order for us to actually have diversity, equity, and inclusion, we must have representation at the top because there is a trickle down effect and that's what we do. I really recommend for everyone to check that out because we need this. We need this a long time ago and time's up. The other organizations you may have heard of, which is We Open Tech, is an organization that's for marginalized genders to all come together in tech and security, and for allies too, because without allies, we're not gonna get anywhere. 
and is to really bring a welcoming environment for all of us, no matter what our gender is, that we're able to get whatever role that we want in our life and have the career that we should have, regardless of who we are. Hacking is Not a Crime is another organization that I co-founded with my friend Brian. And we're basically trying to change things by challenging public perception of the hacker community so then we could get a change when it comes to out-of-date legislation because hackers deserve protections and they deserve rights. And it's about time that we've had it because it's been since the 80s since we've had legislation and it's even before Y2K, it doesn't even add up to even today's standards. So we need to revisit that. Other than that, just giving you all the spiel of all the things I do, but um, I'm a consultant at this time. I basically do product marketing. We're mostly looking at organizations to help grow and be more strategic with their growth internally as well. Um, I do provide an advice column for Security Boulevard called Ask Chloe. So every Friday it drops a new one and feel free to always ask me a question so then I can answer it. Don't worry, it will always be anonymous. I uh, also the host of the Change Making Podcast on ITSP Magazine. So if you want to learn what are the issues in tech today and you want to get involved and roll up your sleeves with the change makers that are doing the work, this is a perfect place for you to learn about them. And if anything else that I'm missing out, go ahead and visit standoutintech.com. Now, I really want to get into the real stuff while you're here because you're here not to about me. You're here to learn about our industry and what's going on right now. So this room may look really familiar to you. Let's say this is RSA conference actually about a year ago. And we're all in this room. We had absolutely no idea what was heading our way. We, some of us had doomsday idea, but we didn't think it was ever gonna be what we have seen in the past year or so. But we were all in this, you know, going to events. We were like shaking hands, we we're getting each other hugs, we were, we're like yelling in each other's ears because it's so noisy and crowded around us. And we had absolutely no idea what was just about to happen. That's what happened later on. And at that point, by the end of 2020, we're just wanting it to end. And even in 2021 at this time, there's this, there's this glimmer of hope and we're, we can actually get there if we work together collaboratively because we have to, we have to come together. When we're so broken up, we have to come together, but let's also be real to be able to come together. We have to recognize that right now we're walking on a very fine line of just being barely okay and terrible. And all of us have been dealing with burnout at some point this year. Okay, well, maybe not all of us. I'm looking at you, New Zealand. But even New Zealand, even before 2020, we've had ongoing issues. And it's been because of our industry. The way that it's set up is not for us to succeed. And that's one of the reasons that we have to look at this, that this has been an ongoing problem before all the chaos in 2020. So it's best that we actually do something about it instead of just talking about it. And with burnout, we need to understand that we're placing ourselves and our organizations at secure risk. And we'll most likely click on a link because we're not 100% who we are. And we may not patch right or be overwhelmed by what is needed to be patched ASAP. But let's also be real. Sometimes we've seen as bots and not as humans. And humans can handle 24 seven work. It's just be realistic with each other because we're working all hours and we're expected to be on all calls. So how do we even balance a personal life and a work life? Because burnout occurs when we do not practice self-care. And when our work demands more from us and we spend less time on our personal life, the balancing is completely gone and stress increases. We feel really guilty and we struggle to sleep because we feel like we're trying so hard not to drown. And you may even notice changes on your team, such as your employees are drawn or being very fast to become angry or sad or delays in the email responses or projects. And this can be seen when remote too. You don't have to be present to not see it. And right now working from home and remotely has increased the number of work hours. It has also increased this expectation and really increases the blurriness of 
work time and limits. And some people have quit at this point because they cannot handle the juggling of work and personal life because their company failed them. I want you to understand that. The company failed them because they couldn't be more flexible and they don't practice inclusion and equity as well. And that's one of the things I'll just quickly touch on is that we are all able to get burned out. But the ones that tend to get burned out the fastest are the ones that are always seen as the type A, the ones that are always get their work done on time. And it's very hard for them to recognize sometimes when they're already feeling burned out. But also, when it comes to those that are marginalized persons inside our community, they are striving to be on top of everything and will take additional work and jobs because it's already hard as it is to have that job because job security isn't there. So that also is a contributing factor to always having this off balance lifestyle of life and work because we're not doing any actual proper diversity, equity and inclusion at this time. And let's be blunt, we haven't had a nine to five job for ages. It doesn't exist anymore. And this is a contributing factor of why employers are pushing employees to work from nine to five. And yet they still send emails at all hours. They slack you at all hours. And this places you and your team at a losing situation because they feel obligated to respond. And this is why the burnout cycle continues. And for those who are not aware of what burnout starts to form and look like, it can be that it used to take a few minutes to respond to an email, but now it takes an hour or so. You feel exhausted and trapped, and you may even feel empty. You push yourself to a breaking point and where you're no longer coming up with ideas, but rather you're taking meds to help with the aches. You're overly anxious, and, and that could be over events, that could be over deadlines, it could be anything. And you can easily cry or get angry faster than usual. You may not even respond to your friends and family when they call or text for some time. And then that's when that guilt starts entering a little bit because your personal life is slipping and your life is now your work and you start to feel unappreciated for your work. And that gets even worse because then you start getting resentful at your job. And then you end up hating it. You start dreading your job. And this is the moment where you may lose your team members. And sometimes it gets so bad that we have people that leave our industry because it's left such a bad taste. And this is the thing that we have to understand and recognize because what we've been doing is putting employees at a huge health risk. And if you don't believe me, here we go in here. So something to keep in mind is that no matter how much sleep, you just feel exhausted when you're burned out. You feel also emotionally depleted, which can mimic depression. And you may even struggle to sleep, such as trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. And when we're stressed out and cortisol levels increases, it's hard to shut down our minds. And this causes us to toss and turn and reduce deep sleep or even get enough REM. And when we don't get proper sleep, the stress levels increase and mental state can start shifting to anxiety and depression symptoms. And when we're overly anxious or experience depression symptoms, we start to get sick a lot more often. And we start having gastrointestinal issues, headaches, infections, colds, flus, cold sores, rashes, or irritated skin, lower immune system. And when our immune system is so low and the stress is high, our joints and muscles start to stiff because your body's on survival mode thinking that there is a perceived threat. It can even turn into muscle weakness and fatigue. If left untreated, this prolonged stress increases high blood pressure, heart attacks, and strokes because there's too much adrenaline and cortisol over an extended period. So overall, clearly, burnout is not a joke. It's actually very serious. And if we don't take care of this right now, we are keep putting our colleagues in a huge risk and ourselves as well. So let's start looking at the results of our industry, of what happens when the reality of working in security, because the high demand 24 seven. So these facts are taken from dark reading and I'm gonna read them to you. 
But please note that these stats in this research was collected prior to the pandemic. Uh, this article did come out in 2020. However, it does not reflect what we've gone through to this date point. So please note that these statistics are probably much higher than what is being reported on the screen or what I'm reading out loud to you. So 21% of CISOs said that they have taken a leave of absence because of job-related stress. 41% of CISOs took the significant step, even though many reported being afraid to take sick days. At 35% neglected to take all their time allotted off. 48% of CISOs said that their work stress has impacted their mental health, while 35% said that this impacted their physical health. And 40% of CISOs said that their work stress has impacted their relationships with their families, or their children, and 32% said that it impacted their relationships with spouses or romantic partners. And 32% said it has impacted their relationship with their friends, and 23% said that they're using medication or alcohol to manage stress. Once again, I wanna reiterate, these stats are probably a lot higher than what I'm reading right now. And it should also be stated that the other reason is that simply we're also scared to be transparent with other people about the situation that we're in, especially when it comes to mental health. We don't really talk about it with each other. And this is a problem because if we don't talk about it, then how does it ever get addressed? So here are some more stats around CISOs. 94% of the American CISOs and 95% of UK CISOs reported that they worked beyond their contracted hours, on average 10 hours a week or more. In addition, 83% of American C-suite execs and 73% of UK execs confirmed they do indeed expect security teams to work longer hours. In other words, we are expected to work beyond normal work hours. In other words, everything that we're doing, we're always going to be expected to be on call. That means there's never a moment to relax because you never know when you'll be on call and it's expected of you. This is not normal for most roles, but it is for our industry. Now, the thing to understand is that the CISO is your manager and your leader and having someone who's burned out that leads can become something very dangerous to employers. Uh, this could also lead to security risk and increasing possibilities of managerial issues. Coping with such issues can lead to them self-medicating on the job and making a very thin of what is appropriate. But once again, this is not the CISO's fault. I want to reiterate, the CISO's job is so hard because as we all know, whenever there's a breach, they're the ones that are blamed. They're the, always the first one to be cut. It's, it is extremely stressful to have this role and most CISOs only spend up to one year in that role in the first place. So this is letting you know, once again, we have a system that is very, very broken. We have an industry that isn't sufficient in the long run. It's never matured. And it's in this industry that it continues to fail us. And it runs on people being burned out. And I wanna take a moment here. We have a foundation that doesn't empower us at all. We have a foundation that disempowers us in every single way. And there's no wonder we have a rotating door and a mental health crisis in our industry. And I'm about to show you why it's like this. So why are we so burned out? Well, of course, being in security, we monitor and operate 24 seven. And sometimes we work throughout the middle of the night and sometimes we cannot sleep well because we're always at the edge of our seat. And when it comes to security, because we know attackers work at all hours and we're always worried of when that breach will occur because we all know that if there was a breach, it would be an ad hoc style to fix it. Don't believe me? According to the Ponemon Institute, while security response planning is slowly improving over the years, the vast majority of organizations interviewed was about 74% and they're still reporting that their plans are either ad hoc or applied inconsistently or that they have absolutely zero plans at all. And additionally, more than half, 52% of those security response plans said that they've never reviewed it since it was created or it's had no set time period of reviewing or testing those actual plans. So with COVID-19 and working from home, how many of these plans have been updated? 
Yeah, this is one of the reasons why we had a 300% increase of breaches last year. And you know what we tend to do about it in our industry? We don't, we don't think of better planning and having less disruption. We throw tools at it because it's so much easier to understand the human element role that plays here. It's, it's so, it, it draws, it just, I don't know. As someone who came from outside the security world and came in, it is always the thing that we do, which is like, oh, we have a problem. Let's just do, let's just throw another tool in. The thing is, is that if you don't have a proper foundation of understanding the human element plays a huge role in security because security is built by humans in the first place, how are we going to be successful? So throwing tools at it is not going to be helpful. If anything, it's going to make the situation a lot worse because when we add tools to it, guess what happens? It's not in the plan and coordination is off. And these third party tools, we don't know how secure they really are. Are you feeling stressed out yet? Perhaps cortisol levels rising? No, well then I want you to imagine another situation. I know cruise ship, you know, this is gonna get one of those type of stories. But I want you to imagine you're part of a crew, okay? And you just found out your ship is sinking. And, but you found out after for some time because you weren't alerted by your system. And your customers are on board trusting you for their safety. And your team is scared and some are actually paralyzed by the fear of failing, but they're trying their best. But there's one thing you need to know, your crew hasn't slept at all for quite some time and they have a bit of seasickness. I mean, you could actually say that they're not exactly 100% state of mind. They're not 100% charged battery. If anything, you could say they're kind of functioning as if they have burnout because it's kind of the same rate and scope. Okay, so now you have the backstory. That's your situation that you're in. Now imagine your captain pulls out the binder, this safety binder that you're like, oh, thank God there's a protocol here, an incident response plan, and it's up to date, right? No, unfortunately that binder that was updated is not on the ship and you're actually having, you're actually using an old procedure but have new features to this ship. Are you stressed out now? Because this is what it's like when we're dealing with bad plans and when the human element is not taken into account of. It leaves you with a wreckage. The truth is bad actors are everywhere and they attack at all hours and zero days drop often and we constantly need to be up to date of what bad actors use. That takes energy and time. And this is why we're struggling. We're part of the crew and we don't function well or communicate well, and it becomes a really scary situation. The reason we're insecure is because we know how incredibly important it is. But we also need to come to terms that if we work around the clock and don't practice self-care or even promote employee wellness, what's the point of all of this? Because then we could be a danger to the organization as well if we're running on low battery and feeling not well. And this is why burnout matters. It's not just a trendy thing, it's a very real thing. And this is why if we keep turning to tools to try to fix our problem and not find time to plan, prep, practice self-care, we become that security team that sinks. We won't be able to fix a breach fast and it's scary. And I really want to just reiterate here that please, whatever you do, do not turn around and blame your employees for this and because they're not performing as well. Because the majority of you, that is what you tend to do. You let go of a team member without checking to see what you could have done that, re that possibly could have reduced their performance because chances are they're probably burned out and feeling very much alone. With COVID-19, we're taking care of family members on camera daily, unable to leave our homes, can't see our friends and family. Some of us live alone. Some of us put off important life events. We've also lost people. We've also are seeing our colleagues struggling. We're trying to be there. We're always worried about our, 
our ability to perform and keeping a job. We're worried about affording the life that we have and we're worried about COVID. We're worried we may not make it through either. We're not a machine, we are human. The human element created security and runs security. We're all struggling with staying okay before COVID and during COVID. And I want you to acknowledge that. Except New Zealand, okay? I'm just gonna be real with you. New Zealand had it pretty well. And, and there's a reason why. And I wanna talk about that. So how can we lead like the prime minister of New Zealand? I mean, think about it. She worked with people and planned. And when you plan, there's less disruption. So we're going to go through a couple of investment things. So here's the first investment. Listen, take action together. In other words, be strong, be kind, ask your team what they need. It's so simple, right? Whenever people are like, well, how can I do better? Ask your team. Don't ask me. Ask your team. They're going to tell you how to be better because they live in that environment. They know that environment. They are in there every single day doing the job they're supposed to be doing. They're hearing from their colleagues. They know how to do better. You just have to ask and listen. And don't just listen also. I just wanna reiterate this. Take an action. When we listen to each other and strategize together on how to improve the team and our department, it reduces stress for everyone because stress happens when we're not being listened to or we feel uncomfortable to speak up. Your colleagues may share that certain tools aren't needed or that there's a tool that does like five things all in one that is better. And they may share what is missing on the team. And perhaps less meetings are needed as well. By working together on what are the issues, we can collaborate together on how to reduce the issues or completely resolve them. Investment number two, plan together, strategize together. With collaboration and listening, working together with a team to make strategies, revisit your security response plans. Make it up to date. Revisit that plan every time a new tool is added or removed or there's a team member change or environment change and so on. It is so critical that by creating and making solid plans, it helps speed up your recovery, reduces the stress of when a breach occurs, that there's a plan to follow that's up to date. You owe it to yourselves and your colleagues, your organization, your customers. I mean, look at what New Zealand did. They planned. Not only did that, they strategized together. They had 25 deaths. You know how many deaths we've had in the US? Over 560,000 deaths in the US because there were people that didn't want to listen to the people around them that knew how to do better. And they didn't want to take action on how they could do better. I know that's controversial what I just said, but it is the truth. Because we have to work together. We have to listen to each other. We have to do that. Otherwise, we're going to fail all together. So keep your ego in check on that one. Investment number three, encourage self-care. Studies have shown that when dealing with burnout, taking one week off from work or anything related to work provides recovery for a burnout. And I wanna say for like a mild to moderate burnout, if you have a severe burnout, that could take two weeks or more. So, but that one week does help you recover slowly. So if your employee is burnt out, make sure that they feel support to take time off and also encourage it off into the team because a lot of times we may not wanna take time off because we're worried about how it will be like for our team members for us to be gone or we're also a lot more nervous and burnt out with the thought of what we're gonna walk into when we get back. But the good news is that when you come back from taking time off, it helps a lot because we have a lot more clear space in our head so we're able to take it on a little bit better. So it's really important that we always encourage self-care and taking time off and being flexible. That also means looking at work hours as well. And lastly, you should probably make sure to have one day per week where you have absolutely zero meetings. And this allows your colleagues to catch up on any items or projects. Investment number four, be kind and respect boundaries. Please be kind to one another. It is so frustrating to see throughout a pandemic where people are being cruel to one another. 
it's not when the whole world seems like it's in chaos. That is the time where we need to come together. We put our egos to the side or behind us. And we start thinking about how our actions impact others. It's important that we understand that what we say and what we do can impact another individual. So think it over before you take an action. It's so important that we do this because we need to be kind to one another. Like seriously, it shouldn't be like this sometimes. Because from what we have learned is that when we work together and understand how we impact others, we are then starting to practice empathy. And empathy is certainly missing at our times in our industry. But by listening and being there for one another, it reminds us that there's people who care for each other because we cannot assume how one person is doing just by how they look or how they're doing on their performance. You could be a high achiever and be in a really, really hard place. So it's really important that we don't know what each other is going through, but we can always be there for one another and try to understand. So instead of going at someone, refrain from that and think before you speak or act because you really don't know how that will impact another person. So as New Zealand shares their be kind message, it's because there's an element that we need to stick together to protect the world together. But also know that being kind is respecting work boundaries such as six feet of distance and a mask. So what can you do right now? Okay, so this is what I would love for you guys to do. Take a screenshot of this or take a photo of this. Share it with the people around you. Share it with your employer. Share it with your boss. Share it with your colleagues. Because this only takes 15 minutes to do all these things right now that you see on here. Set up a weekly one-on-ones for 15 minutes with each employee. If you're a manager, you should be doing that. And then after that one-on-one -on -one with them, don't have any more meetings with them. Just do it once a week for up to 15 minutes. This is how you build a relationship. This is how you build trust. Because when you're micromanaging, which was a really big issue throughout the pandemic for many folks, because there's this belief that if I don't see you in the office, then I don't think you're working. So micromanaging has been very high up there and a lot of complaints these days. So do this instead. Set up a weekly one-on-one for 15 minutes with your employee. And on that, talk about the projects that are you know, on the roadmap. And also, what are the items to prioritize? Make it a conversation. Be there for your employee. This is a great way how to start a trust. Now, the next thing you could do is make a Monday or a Friday a no meetings day. And the reason I say a Monday or a Friday because it doesn't really impact the week that much because usually a Monday or a Friday falls on a holiday. So it doesn't, it doesn't hurt as much. So making one of those days as a no meetings day is great because that could be that day that everyone uses to conquer any projects that are they're behind or their emails because I know about you, but I like being a zero inbox person. And so that would help a lot for those folks. The next thing is set up a meeting with the team to explore ways to improve together. And this is important. If you don't have an incident response plan or if your incident response plan has been out of date or you don't even know that if you have an incident response plan, now is the time to talk about that. Meet together, discuss, what are the tools that we have right now? What tools do we need? What tools do we not need? What things do we need on our team? How can I be a better manager? How can I be a better leader for our department when it comes to me talking to other departments? What can I do to make things better? Because as a manager, it's your job to be a coach, a mentor, it's not your job to dictate how things should be. It's about working together collaboratively and making sure that your team can thrive by pushing them up there. And also, the last thing that you can always do is create an anonymous survey, and I mean that, anonymous. Then there might not be everyone who wants to respond to that survey because they're always worried if it is actually anonymous and they're worried that something's gonna happen. So you really wanna make sure of it, but also know that you can't enforce it because people need to build trust and trust is shown over time through actions. Now, lastly, remember when we work together and listen to each other, magic does happen. And when we work together, making sure people get personal time off without the fear of taking time off, we are then becoming collaborative. 
And when we collaborate, we reduce the stressful items that hold back the team from thriving. And when we focus on balancing work and personal life for everyone, that's when we no longer have this dumpster fire. And burnout is no longer a security concern for us because we know we are human and we know that the human element rules the world that we live in. And whenever in doubt, just remember, if New Zealand can plan so well, so can you. Because in all of us, there's a Frodo who's on a journey to get rid of some malicious threat. So quick overview over this whole talk, if you spaced out at all, burnout does place you and your team at a huge risk, not just mentally, but physically as well. The best way how to actually deal with burnout and reduce it is to collaborate to form strategies to improve the team by asking your team how to do better and listening and taking action. Start making plans and revisit secure response plans. Seriously, we need to do better at that. And I know we don't really have enough time sometimes to go into response plans and trying to make it better, but we have to do this. We owe it to ourselves and everyone around us who are impacted by it. It will help us because if there is a breach and we have an incident response plan that is up to date, we're gonna be feeling a little bit better because we will know that we have everything covered as much as we did have it covered. And most importantly, promote self-care by being kind and respectful to boundaries. Please respect one another, you guys. Please be nice to each other. It is so important that we do that because we're in this community together. We're a small community and it, whenever something happens to someone, it does impact other people. So we have to be aware of this, that our actions and words do hold value and can also impact another individual positively and negatively. So we must do better as ourselves. I just wanna say thank you all so much for attending this talk. And if you want to ask any questions, I'm here. I do have over time, so I'm gonna stop sharing now my screen and answer any questions that you guys have. So I uh, haven't seen many questions. Uh, that was that was actually a wonderful talk. Uh, there was a few things you mentioned in there that, that that I noticed a lot of people, you know, personally related to, especially the zero inbox. So uh, yeah, that, that that's like a myth as far as you know. I know. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, uh, you know. there there but are it, strategies to get there, but I have to admit, like the zero, how I do it. This may be this actually might be a good skill for some other folks if that that have that issue. So what I do is I open my emails. Every time I get an email, I open it. If it's something that is gonna take longer than a couple of minutes to respond, I have to review, look over something, I star it. So then I have a zero inbox at all times, but I go back to the star items when I have more time throughout the day. This helps me don't get overwhelmed because I'm a, I'm a type A person. I have to answer emails. So it's one thing is one way how to go about that is you still have that zero inbox thing, but just note that it's not the unread. It's also knowing what to prioritize. That's going to help you out with that zero inbox idea. Uh, another thing that you, that you actually, I'm going to take that into consideration. I, I have a tendency to star uh, too many things, but another thing you mentioned that I really liked was you were, you were saying that, uh, that about how companies, uh, you know how they use tools and things and I, I mentioned it in chat that they tend to when they have these breaches they want to hire you know they want to add a red team or hire and these are things that are very costly when you know the real truth is, is if they had, if they had took you know took the time to you know pay attention to their employees and, and, and offered you know some sort of service which would be a lot cheaper they could probably avoid that and, and you know to some degree and it would be a lot more cost effective to them and a lot more healthy to the people, to them and the people that work for them. Yeah, it's uh, the, it's like this constant situation of, I always think of like firefighting in some ways where we're so into putting out the fire that we don't do preventative work because we're like, well, I don't see any return of investment. So the, I don't need to add money to this, but however, Oh my God, when there's a breach, suddenly, oh, here's all the money in the world. And you're like, where was this money before? We could have avoided this situation. 
I mean, as someone who worked in like marketing and PR, I feel like it's better to do preventative work over than reactive work because a breach is going to happen. No matter what, a breach is going to happen. You don't know when, but being prepared helps a lot. Definitely, definitely. I agree. The, we, uh, we do have a question. So uh, <laughs> somebody wanted to know, they said, how do you support employees in staying offline when they're on PTO? Uh, I made it clear. I don't expect people to be online, but some still carry their laptops around on their days off. Uh, yeah, it's one of those things where it's it's a tricky thing because you can't really tell them stop responding to messages. But I have to admit, I have I remember last year I took my first vacation in two and a half years for one week, and I the first day I was responding to emails, and then my manager's like stop responding you're on your time off i'm going to start telling people to stop writing to you and i was like it just hit me in that moment like oh wow i'm so i felt like i was a workaholic in that moment so the trick is is when you're talking to your employees about taking time off remind them that it's a good time to disconnect um meaning like you know this might be a good time for you to turn off your devices, get off of social media for a bit, or just get away from InfoSec in general. And don't try to study for some uh, cert test, like really just take that time off for yourself to do something like, I don't know, learn how to play guitar, paint. But that's the thing is like, we have to be encouraging them to understand that it's okay. It's okay. Like we have to be reinforcing them. It's okay for you not to respond. You're on your time off but do remind them that they should put in on their calendar that they're going to be away. And also that I have that, you know, out of office message. And the trick for that, for everyone that is always concerned about that, I'm going to tell you something that is very easy to do. First thing, when you're about to take your break and everything, make sure you send, have your out of message scheduled your message. Now you want to make sure in there that you state one or two days after the date that you come back. So say if you are coming back on the 14th, you're gonna say, I'm coming back on the 16th. This helps you so much because no one's expecting you to respond until after the 16th then. Also on your calendar, you wanna take that whole day, the first day you come back, block it. Completely block it. Meaning no one can set up any meetings for with you. No, you just have that day for you to respond to emails and catch up on what jobs you need to do. And when you come back on your first day, also make sure that you look at your emails, kind of get a sense of what's going on. But then what you're going to want to do is message your teammates and ask if there's any pressing issues that you need to respond with the next 24 to 72 hours. That So then you can also draw your attention to that. This helps you be on top of everything, gives you about two-day period of catching up and without having any impact or stress on you. Very true. I, I personally, uh, one of my main worries uh, when it came to when it comes to take time off is, can I afford it? Uh, you know, and questions like that. And instead of you know realizing that, you know, regardless of whether I can, you know, quote unquote, afford it, my mental health is more important because it will affect me more long term than say a short term problem that I could you know fix in other ways exactly uh, there's it, a, yeah. a, a, a go ahead no oh, obviously exactly it's like that completely if we don't take time off you're going to start failing a little bit more in work and the last thing you want to do is lose your job so always put your mental health first uh okay we have another one uh how have you successfully communicated the value of self-care business cultures to higher ups in my experience culture trickles down from the executive level. Kate, I love you. I don't know you, I don't think, but I don't know, maybe I do know you. But I have to admit one thing to you, you are completely right. When it's the executives, they're the ones that set the vision, they're the ones that are gonna dictate how it's going to impact the rest of the company. This is one of the reasons why I strongly believe we'll never have DII until we actually have those in leadership positions filled by those are marginalized. There's no way we're gonna get anywhere. You're completely right. But the good news is that you have a manager and your manager is supposed to be there to support you. 
And it's so important that they support you. If you have a boss that isn't going to be there for you, that isn't wanting to coach you, mentor you, and see you thrive beyond them, you have a bad boss. I hate to break it to you. A good mentor is someone who's like, so what do you want to do for your career? Excellent. I'm going to help you get there if you want me to help you out. You tell me what you need from me and I will be there. That's a manager that you want. You want a manager that understands to be flexible, but also wants to see you thrive. That is the job of a boss. And they can't really do too much other than to also go to the executive team saying, hey, we have this problem. I've been there before. I go to an executive team like we have this problem. We need to fix this. And it gets ignored because they're thinking of profit. They don't understand that sometimes you don't see the profit immediately. It takes time to show it. I definitely, definitely agree. And, and you know, when I read that question, I, I personally can relate to that because, you know, a lot of companies, like she said, it always, you you go to a meeting and you hear whatever the, the higher ups are telling you about safety and this or that. And, you know, and, and that goes, you know, for most things at, at businesses, but having a business that actually, you know, can reverse that that process and let it flow in the other directions and, and pay attention to what you know the employees are saying and the problems that they're having you know that's that's just as important I yeah mean, if, uh well that uh let's see here we uh i'm trying to read through these uh yeah <laughs> it seems like a lot of people can relate to this and and <laughs> i know i know personally uh yeah they they it's it's a big thing. Uh, I, I'm I'm one one of those people who I can't say no. So I, I end I end up agreeing to this and to that and to this and to that. And before I turn around, uh, all I have are deadlines. And and I look at the, the calendar for today, and oh no! And so here I am at two in the morning, still working. And then oh, I'll take a day off to catch up. Well, that day off, like you said, is meant to not work and yeah. to relax and i just you know i really do i really can relate and I, and I feel like a lot of people in here can too uh i personally have been following chloe for for quite some time now she she has a very a very avid interest in 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 people all people and, and i really like how she, you know she goes for it and tries to to not only change the opinions and the views of people that are, you know, higher, you know, higher up in government all the way down to the average person so that we can all relate to each other and, and have better mental health. Thanks, uh, one Michael. last question. Yeah. One last question we have is how can you set those boundaries after you have been doing it and is now expected and it is now expected. Hmm. That's a great question. Hi, Mickey. <laughs> I would say that um, that's a really good one. I'm going to be honest. There's going to be times where your employer is not going to be happy that you put down boundaries. But the thing is, I want you just to know that if you have other team members that have similar boundaries, this may be a good thing. Um, having kind of like a all hands in for your team or having those like weekly one-on-ones with your manager, it might be a good time to reiterate like, hey, I just want to let you know, um, when you send me a Slack message after 5 p.m., I'm not gonna respond to it. I'll, if it's something urgent, I would prefer that you text me. That's gonna let me know that I need to respond to it because I'm gonna be off of Slack during my off hours so that I can do all the things that I wanna do and I don't wanna be attached to my laptop. Um, that's kind of how the way I've done it in the past, which is like, I'm gonna be offline. Um, I'm always offline at this hours, but if it's ever an urgent thing, text me, call me um, to let me know. I think that's one way how that we can do it is always give them one thing to note, like. This is my this is my boundary. I'm not going to respond during this time. But if there's something urgent during those non-work hours, you can do this instead. I think that's really helpful for everyone because let's be real. I feel like all of us want to be off Slack and Discord us or an hour um, because we just need to turn off our our minds. 
Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I personally uh, have learned a lot from this, and I'm going to try to apply a lot to them. First thing I'm going to do is get on my phone and unpin Discord and Slack because they're pinned. I can't turn them off. Uh, I think. I think. Uh, are, are we out of time? Do we do we have time for one more question, or is I, I don't know. I think the, the cutoff is. Well. Okay. Yeah, we're out of time. Okay. All right. Uh, well, if, if any of y'all do have any further questions uh, for Chloe, I know she she is going to be in the the hopping uh, in the different areas. And Chloe, maybe you could tell them yeah. where you're going to be. So yeah, so I'll I'll take an eye on the comments. I'll respond in the comments. Um, if you want, you can also DM me on Twitter, Instagram or LinkedIn, either of those work. I'm also going to be in the booth on and off for Hacking is Not a Crime and also for We Open Tech. So if you have any questions about those two orgs, I'll be in there too. All right, Will. Uh, all right. Thank you all for showing up and thank you, Chloe, for the awesome presentation. Thank you. Uh, uh, we'll see you all later on the conference. Take care, Bye. everyone. Thank you.